Mark, uh, I'm really happy to, to have you here at the Quantum Machines booth at the APS March meeting. Uh, and I'm also really happy to be the one uh, discussing with you. I'm a big fan of your work, as I told you many times. Okay. And um, so this is the first time that I hear directly from the source. Okay. Like, uh, I want to hear, start, let's say, from a historical perspective. Uh, how did you come to work with atoms and sure. what drives you to yeah. do what you do? Sure. So, I mean, I have been working in uh, technology and science for a long time. Um, I had a atypical career path. I did my bachelor's degree at Caltech, and then mm. I went to industry for about 10 years. Ah. I mean, I had a very successful time as an undergrad, but um, I wasn't so sure what I wanted to work on. So I went to industry, and that was great, and I learned how to work professionally. And then at a certain point, I wanted to get to the next level. So I went back yeah. to... Uh, do my PhD in Boulder and actually worked in nonlinear optics. And okay. in fact, worked in a sense in the same area I'm working in now, which is I worked on information processing. I, I built a uh, optical neural network uh, mm. system uh, for my PhD thesis. Okay. And my PhD was at JILA, which is one of the centers for atomic physics and quantum information. But I didn't do anything with atoms. Okay, but nothing. Uh, not nothing with about atoms that. at the time. Okay. And then I was a, a scientist at a national lab in, in Denmark uh, for about five years. And then uh, actually wanted to work more with atomic physics, and so I, I got a job in Wisconsin. And uh, this was uh, 1999. Mm. And uh, I, you know, I was looking around for what to do. I had some ideas, but they weren't sort of getting full traction in terms of getting funding and building my group. And I read this paper from Peter Zoller and Ignatius Sirac and Misha Lukin and others about, oh, you can do this Ritberg gate thing. Mm. So I read this paper, thought, oh, it looks interesting. Why don't yeah. we do that? We should try. And I, I joined forces with Thad Walker, who was already an expert in atoms. I mean, at that time, I had not cooled a single atom or done any of this. I was wow. learning as a new faculty, which was great. And Very we just started out on the path to do it. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, Ten years later, we had uh, a CNOT gate and the first nice. atomic entanglement at the same time as Philippe Franchet. So there is something Broways. intrinsic about atoms that brought you to this field, although you didn't start from there, but uh, yeah. it felt right. I mean, I really was an optics guy and nonlinear mm. optics. I did a lot of work on solitons and pattern formation, nonlinear dynamics yeah. and optical systems, but I was fascinated by atoms. Mm. And I would say it was serendipitous that... Um, I didn't start working on atoms because we were going to build the world's best quantum computer. And in fact, I really did not think much about building a quantum computer. It just looked like an interesting physics experiment. Yeah. Can we do this control of the atoms and entangle them and yes. create quantum states? Yes. yes. And then, it, serendipitously, um, by good fortune, I would say it turned out to be a really powerful way yeah. to make the world's best quantum computer. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's becoming like a pattern that, that I start to see discussing with the, you know, the founding fathers of the different fields or yeah. uh, the innovators yeah. of each uh, of the field of quantum is that, you know, they start out with something that, that is uh, a passion for them is like yeah. a interesting physics to explore or something like this. And only after uh, they realize there is something, uh, you know, powerful and on which you can, you can build a plan upon. Uh, That's right. Yeah. So let me hear a little bit about your plan for atoms. Like what sure. is... Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, this was academic research, and it was really a quite small field. There were just a few groups trying to do this experimentally, and also just a few groups theoretically looking at this. And then I'd say in the 2010s, it became apparent that, oh, you could actually have a bigger impact, uh, maybe help the world building a quantum computer. And it also became apparent to really stay at the forefront and compete. We needed more resources, mm -hmm. we needed bigger effort, so I got involved with inflection, and uh, I've known the people behind Inflection for a long time. The original founder, Dana Anderson, was my PhD advisor. I see. So I've known Inflection for a long time, so there was... What, what do they do at Inflection? I'm sorry. Well, Inflection, we do multiple things. We're not a pure play quantum computing company. Mm. Uh, I brought in the quantum computing ideas, but now there's a whole team of people working on quantum computing, and we've sold mm. computers, and we will sell more, and we're developing it. But we see atoms as being useful for many things. They're not just useful for quantum computers, but they're useful for quantum sensors, for quantum communication. And so uh, besides the computers, we have an uh, atomic clock product already. I so see. you can buy a box that has a 
optical atomic clock inside it. Yeah. And we're working on sensors, which will also be part of it. So it's not purely just quantum computing. It's not a pure play quantum computing, although yeah. quantum computing is, is the biggest opportunity. Yeah, of course. But it might take uh, a little longer to really get to quantum utility yeah. than these other, a little bit simpler um, applications that yeah. are already there. Yeah, yeah. So quantum utility, you... Quantum you utility. broke the glass. Uh, yeah, when is it going to happen, you want to When ask. is it going to happen? What qubit type is going to reach it first? Uh, all the usual questions. Yeah. What, what do you think? What's your view? Well, I'll, I'll give you some of the usual answers and okay. that we don't really know. And, I mean, if you take a step back and look at what's going on, there's tremendous progress, and we're hearing about a lot of that progress yeah. at this APS meeting, so yes. it, it's very exciting. But I would put it this way that no one actually has an engineering blueprint for how to build a utility-scale quantum computer. True. A lot of people have been trying to convince DARPA that they have such a blueprint lately. Yeah. But um, even if you put a billion dollars on the table, we don't really know how to build it so that we have yes. it in two years or three years. True. But we, we have a clear picture of what are the current impediments, what are some of the roadblocks, what do we need to be doing, which is different for the different technologies. I think, I mean, look, Quantum computers have shown they can do certain calculations, random circuit sampling, that you cannot do on a conventional computer. Yeah. So we've crossed that threshold. Yes. And it was crossed five years ago, and then the classical algorithms caught up, and then the quantum made progress. And that's going to keep happening for a while, just yes. back and forth. When we get to the point of useful in the sense of, can I do a calculation that a company cares about and can make money yeah, on? So not just when it becomes kind of a a commercial or utility... Yeah. You know, people like to say five to ten years, and that's yes. just a placeholder for they don't know. Yes, yes. Um, it's another way of saying in ten years you will have to come back, and I will it will not be the one answer the question then. So yeah, yeah I don't care. <laughs> you know, famously, uh, Bill Phillips used to say Nobel Prize winner in atomic physics uh, for for laser cooling. He used to say fifty fifty. 50% chance in 50 years. Yes. I would say, I think that's way too pessimistic now given okay. the, the progress, but you know, 10 years plus minus a factor of pi Yes. <laughs> is, is what I'll say, Very something nice. like that. So Very it could be nice. three years, it could yes. be 30 years if yes. things are harder. We have seen a lot of the progress in uh, you know, superconducting and other fields. Atoms really you know, seems to have struck a gold mine or uh, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the progress in atoms in the last uh, couple of years and what you expect in the next sure. couple yeah. of years? So, as I said a couple minutes ago, atom, atomic qubits was a very small community for a number of years. Mm. We demonstrated c not gates, entanglement. We started building arrays with 50 and 100 qubits, but it was uh, still a very small field and the fidelity was low. And in a sense, we were kind of stuck. And I think 2016 was a very pivotal year mm. in that three groups independently, uh, the group in Korea, Jay Wook An, Lucan Group at Harvard, and uh, Antoine Broes in Paris, all demonstrated these atom uh, rearranging techniques where yeah. you could fill in the gaps and get these arrays with an atom at every site. Yes. And that was game changing, absolutely. And yes. that enabled the field to really progress. Moving an atom individually or a bunch of atoms right, individually. individually. Yeah, in, in different wow. ways. And that's become one of the, the tools of the trade for, for building these larger systems. So that was a big thing. And the other big thing was a better understanding of how to get to high fidelity. And the, yes. the first gates that we and others did were you know just barely entangled and not great. We made it a bit better. But I'd say two things happened. One, people came up with better protocols on the mm. theory side understanding more clearly what was limiting fidelity and how to design the laser pulses to improve on that. And secondly, understanding that the lasers we were using were not good enough and we needed to do more work on reducing laser noise. Okay. Those two aspects together have led to these very high fidelities where you know the field is now close to three nines. Yes, wow. Very and nice. that also happened in the last uh, four or five years or so. Okay. And so now we have a... Uh, sort of base of these very large arrays, you know, many thousands of qubits, high fidelity, people are working to put all the pieces yeah. together. So the building Logical blocks are there. Building blocks are there, though there's still work to be done in making these, these blocks uh, more powerful yeah. and more flexible. Yeah. And, you know, there's ongoing work, but there's yes. 
tremendous tool set now to work with. And now we're seeing these arrays with multiple thousands from different yes. groups, yes. continuous reloading to deal with atom loss, it's a cryogenic systems to increase vacuum lifetime. Yeah. So, you know, I'm very excited. And I think if you sort of dispassionately look at the rate of progress yes. in this subfield compared to the other platforms, you know, we're going as fast or faster than any other We should approach. be rooting all for atoms, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very excited about it. Yes, it's, it's an exciting field. It, yeah. Every, uh, you know, subfield of quantum uh, seems yeah. uh, incredibly exciting yeah. now. I'm particularly excited about atoms. I, I don't come from the right background to understand all of the details, but it's, it's exciting to see, you know, the rate of progress. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's above the charts. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so tell me a little bit of something about your lab's research, what, what are you working on? Sure, now? yeah, so in my lab, uh, University of Wisconsin, we're working mainly on two areas. I mean, we're actually working computing, communication, and sensing, so we okay, have an so activity well. in all areas, but primarily computing and quantum networking. Yeah. On the computing side, we're working right now on a new experiment to try and push the fidelity. Yes. Tired of being behind on fidelity, and we have yes. a path, I think, to get uh, perhaps leading to qubit gate fidelity. And so, what uh, would that look like? Like, uh, so this is with cesium atoms and uh, ultraviolet laser light, which is um, annoying to have to work with because the lasers are more difficult. Yes, you suffer optical damage and so on. But I think this is the route to getting to very high fidelity. So I'm excited about that, yep. and uh, we look to have the first data in the next couple months. Amazing. And then we're also working on what I think is a great approach for doing logical qubits and error correction, which is a atomic quantum computer that has two different types of atoms. Okay. So a machine with rubidium and cesium. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, is an old idea that we thought about a long time ago. Uh, it's been great progress from Hans Bernin at Chicago, mm -hmm. and now he's at Innsbruck, uh, demonstrating two species arrays, demonstrating gates between the species. Uh, we're very working nice. on that at the university, but also at inflection. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So, and in your research, what is the role of, uh, of control systems for you? Like yeah, control is important because once you've built these uh, complicated laser optical vacuum systems, you put them in a box, you close the box, you preferably don't touch it, and yes. the work is at the computer, actually. Yes. And the computer talks to the electronics, it talks to the, the atoms. And, you know, we, we have quantum machines hardware in our system and also hardware from other vendors and hardware we develop ourselves. Yeah. And uh, as we progress to error correction with logical qubits, the control system becomes even more important. I mean, it's already also, indispensable. You yeah. cannot do these experiments without a computer without right, controlling uh, electronics. Process. Yes, yes. But as we get even more advanced and start doing real-time yeah. branching and decoding, I see. Uh, distillation, then the control system will need to be more powerful, have more flexibility, more capability, yeah. fast processing, and so on. Yes, I see, I see. So it, it's, uh, it's also a progressing field. Uh, we have yes. to keep up uh, with your, uh, the requirements from your side yes. of, uh, uh, of the table, of course. Um, so what, what would you say the next big challenge is for, for atoms? Like, what are you... You said, you mentioned fidelity. Yeah. I guess uh, it's important to have high fidelity. That, that's going to yeah. be the basis of uh, what comes next. Yeah. But what's the next thing? Yeah. What's the next challenge? So, you know, atoms are great qubits because mm. they're, they're natural qubits. They're all identical. They have excellent coherence. We yes. can do these Rydberg gates. They also have some aspects that are, let me say, a little annoying compared to superconducting yes. or spin qubits and that they can disappear, right? They can leave the trap because yes. of uh, are collisions. Are they allowed to do that? They are allowed, to, well, <laughs> we'd like to say no, but yes. they do it anyway, <laughs> right? So they go away, so we have to replace yeah. them. There's also the fact that the, the qubit is in the spin, mm. but the atom is a you know, piece of stuff. It's some neutrons and protons and electrons, and it's moving around in these traps. Yeah. And if the atom gets too hot, that motion can get entangled with the spin, and that leads to decoherence. And when you perform gates, when you perform measurements, the atoms can heat up a little bit. Yeah. And so actually demonstrating that we can do repetitive measurements either by recooling the atoms without disturbing other uh, atomic qubits or by not heating them up even though we measured them, yeah. that's still really an outstanding challenge. 
there's been lots of work uh, measuring and and doing error correction, mm. but not repetitive uh, measurements and error correction at the level we need to run deep circuits. So that's okay. that's one of the forefront challenges in my mind. So if mind, I understand correctly, it's a, it's a challenge in um, measuring the atoms and getting the information that you need without disturbing the system too much? Is yeah, so for any qubit modality, if we do, we do a von Neumann measurement, a projective measurement, we measure the qubit state, and then we may want to reset it to a fiducial state. Yeah. And we can do that with the atoms. Yes. But when we measure atomic qubits, we also disturb the motional state. Yes. And so we need to keep that motional state calm. Yeah. And demonstrating that either you don't disturb the motional state mm -hmm. or you can you know, settle it down again yeah. repeatedly in a coherent way okay. really has yeah. not been so done that, yet. That's where the repetition comes yeah. into play. Yeah. You, want, you want something that is stable in time. Let's yes. say that you can do multiple operations on to and keep it stable over time. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's what you're yeah. kind of uh, leading towards in the yeah. work in your lab. Yeah. Yeah. But, but let me ask you, you're, you're with quantum machines yes. and uh, your hardware, I think, initially was developed to work with superconducting qubits yes. primarily. Yeah. We also use it for atoms, but you're not exactly perfectly aligned with all of the requirements that we have for atoms. How do you yeah. think about it? Yeah, so it's a bit of a trade-off, right? So there is... Uh, there is many different fields. Nobody knows where the utility will really come from. Yeah. Um, what, we, what we do know is that we want to enable researchers to do interesting experiments first, uh, interesting physics, and then eventually to build large-scale, utility-scale systems. Uh, so at the moment, the more, like let's say, commercially available systems are on, on superconducting. It's also historically the... the um, uh, let's say the know-how of the company comes from uh, superconducting. Now, nowadays, we have you know expertise in, in most different qubit types, but the requirements will will never exactly line up with uh, with all of the different qubits out there. So, one approach is to build different products for different uh, qubits. Uh, that creates an additional challenge of uh, of you know logistics and mm -hmm. uh, uh, even just the maintenance of the product is a challenge in itself. But it turns out that a lot of different qubit types uh, just need, you know, different frequency. But uh, for example, in terms of latencies, one one example is the latency. Once you have uh, ma made a product that has the latency required for superconducting qubits, it's probably okay for most other qubit mm -hmm. types. Uh, of course, there is there is some, you know, some specs, let's say, that are like this that. You do the worst case scenario first, and the others will kind of line up. Uh, in other cases, it's not that simple. So we are const constantly trying to evaluate these trade-offs to see whether it will make sense to make a new product for a certain uh, uh, qubit type, or whether we can, you know, modify existing products or build new versions. So it's uh, it's really important for us to have these conversations because that's where uh, that's where you come in and say, look, this spec is not uh, exactly how I would like it to be. And uh, we go back to our lab and say, okay, how do we solve this? Is there a, a way that we can, you know, uh, make it in a commercial uh, product that, that solves the issue, but it's also sustainable for us? Okay, good. I'll just correct one thing you said. Um, also, atomic quantum computers are commercially available. Yeah, Inflection absolutely. Inflection will be happy to sell you one. Yes, <laughs> yes. When can I buy one? You can buy one today. We'll yeah, be happy yeah. to, to uh, discuss. Yes, very nice. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank you for uh, for your time. Thank it you. It was a great discussion. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I hope you to see you around at the conference and, and at the next conference. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.